What is up my creative fellas? Welcome again to another tutorial. The most terrible artworks of the century. I've brought you some of my old works from when I was a noob and we're gonna learn from my mistakes so that you my friend avoid them. Hmm, interesting. So let's go. But before that, please subscribe and like this video. Thanks in advance. But I gotta warn you though, you might see some stuff that are extremely ridiculous. Do not laugh. Now let's see what we got. I got this image that I made a very long time ago and that looks ridiculous. <laughs> By just looking at this image, you get the feeling that something is not right. It's not right, okay? And in most cases, when you do not know what the problem is, it is going to be the perspective because Nobody even knows how perspective works. So when the perspective is off in an image, they do not know what's wrong. But it is about the perspective. I could not get the perspective right in this composite because I had no idea what perspective is. So if you are like the old me, if you do not know what perspective means, I'm gonna give you a quick explanation of what perspective is and how you can very easily and at a basic level, guess the perspective. Here is another composite of mine I made a month ago, and this has the right perspective. So let's see how to find the perspective. If you wanna find the perspective, you have to first find the vanishing point. The vanishing point is where all the converging lines in an image cross each other. Let's find the vanishing point, and after that, the horizon line in this example. So I'm going to delete all the unnecessary layers. We don't need them. We only want the model and the background. I will grab my line tool and I'll make sure that I'll choose the stroke and I will disable the fill and I'll increase the weight. Make sure it is set to pixels. Then I will create a layer and I'll just follow the lines on the background you see all those lines on the floor just follow them and they will meet at a point which is called vanishing point if you follow all the lines they will all converge to that one single point which is called the vanishing point and onto the vanishing point lies the horizon line so now that you know where all the lines meet you can uh, create another layer, maybe change the color and increase the weight and draw a line which crosses that point. That is your horizon line. So as you can see, the horizon line in this image is, is this red line. And you have to do the same process for your foreground. You have to find the horizon line of the foreground, which is me, the model. And when you put these two images together, you want to make sure that the horizon lines of the two images are overlapping each other. Here is another example of a very shitty, garbage, ridiculous looking composite with a very wrong perspective. It's like I'm, I'm in the air, bro. The perspective sucks. And I made this and at that moment I thought it's very cool but now that I look at it I'm so ashamed of myself. Shame on me for making this. <coughs> That's the first tip. Try to get the perspective right. If your perspective is off your image will not look good no matter how much you work on other factors. And by the way this was just a quick explanation of the perspective and stuff like that. If you want a totally in-depth tutorial dedicated to perspective only, let me know in the comments so I can work on it. Moving on to the tip number two. 
After perspective, this is 100% the most important thing in Photoshop. Shadows and highlights. If you do not make your shadows and highlights look real, your whole composite will go to vain. Because shadows and highlights, or in a more general term, the lighting is what convinces the brain that this image is real. If the lighting is not real, then the brain will not believe that it's a believable composite. It'll think it's fake. So now let's get to our examples. In this example, you can see that the shadows I made for this uh, woman and this dog are just not looking okay. If I zoom in onto the image, you will see that the shadow is above this dog's paw. Br bro, how? How did I paint the shadow over there? I don't know, man. But this shadow is not looking cool. It is not real at all. I have painted so much extra shadows that were not necessary. And also the shadows do not look like this. This is totally wrong. So that's why it does not look cool at the first glance. Another problem is that the shadows look brighter than this boot. This boot of this woman is just way darker than the shadow. And that cannot be. Your shadows should be as dark as the darkest parts of your background or your foreground. They cannot be any brighter. So take that into consideration. And the same is true about the highlights. Your highlights cannot be brighter than the brightest part of the background. Let's go back to our first example. In this image, as you can see, there are some gaps in the shadows. How are there gaps in these shadows? Like it does not look good at all. And also all of the shadow is blurry. Shadows do not work this way. They are sharp when they are closer to the object. And as they get further away from the subject, they start to fade out and they get blurry and more blurry and more blurry until they disappear. So they need to be sharp and they just fade away gradually. So try to get your shadows right. And now let me show an example of a mistake in highlights. Here I've got another example of a manipulation that I did long ago. I got a bright light source here at the left and as you can see clearly there are no rim lights. That is a mistake, a big mistake. So if I were to just paint highlights on this thing, if I had just only painted some small rim lights on the edge of this model, it will look a thousand times better and more realistic. So let me do that real quick. I'm going to paint some highlights for you so you can see the difference. And yeah, there you go. Only that little bit of rim light on the edge of this model makes a big difference and it adds to the overall realism of the composite. Also, this crow, it needs rim lights as well. And you know, there are just tons of mistakes over there. <laughs> The next important tip for you guys is depth of field. A pretty common term. I'm sure you guys have heard it before many times from different artists, different tutorials. You've seen it many times before and it actually does matter. This is another example of a composite I made a long time ago and this is probably the least terrible among all of these different composites. It looks good, I know, but there is still some improvements, some mistakes, I better say. As you can see, when I zoom in back into the distance, the mountains are sharp. There is no depth at all. So if I had added some depth into this image, maybe adding some blur or some fog into the distance, it would have added a lot to the overall realism of this composite. So I'm going to do that quickly. I'll create a layer and I will get the blur tool and I will start blurring so you can see the difference. Of course, I do not have access to the layers. So this is not going to be the best way to do it. But just to show you, I'm going to do that. And you can see that what, it, what a difference it makes just with this little bit of blur in the background. And also maybe if I had added some uh, fog in the background, it would look better. But anyways, I don't have the PSD file, so this is probably gonna look trash, but you know what I mean. The depth matters. But yeah, let me just paint some fog here. 
see if I can get this to look any better. Going back to this recent example of mine, um, there is some depth actually. If I turn off this fog layer, you can see you can see the difference, man. It just it, it the fog alone adds a lot to the image. You cannot deny it. Let me actually turn all the blur effects off and then turn them on again so you can spot the difference clearly. So basically, this is how it looks without any depth of field. And let me turn them on again. And this is how it will look with depth of field. Judge for yourself. Okay, I'm not gonna talk. See for yourself before and after. What do you say? One of the most crucial mistakes that many guys make, even sometimes I make, is the lighting and the color matching. Actually, if I just uh, do a quick lighting check with this thing, you can see that I look a lot brighter than the background. And I could have just easily fixed that by just darkening myself with some levels and stuff like that. But unfortunately, I did not have enough knowledge back in the day, so... I didn't do that so I'm gonna fix it real quick right now so you can spot the difference by the way if you do not know why I created that solid layer on top of everything there's a tutorial on that check it out and you just by doing that you can see the difference it just I blend in a lot more with the background now don't I let's do a little bit of color correction as well because I think I'm not the same color as the background enough so I'll create a layer and I'll put it to color mode. I'll sample colors from the background and I will paint on myself. And you are fortunately able to see that before and after and how much of a difference it makes just by matching and paying attention to the light and color. So keep that in mind. They are important very, very much. <laughs> Our next mistake on the list is selection. Man, I've seen many guys just cutting something out of the background, dropping it onto the new background without even paying attention to what they've done. They're just so careless. But a good selection, I think, is the base of a good composite. If your selection is jagged and has a lot of fringes, man, you better work on it. Presenting to you one of my oldest masterpieces. And it looks like shit. But if I zoom onto this, it will even look more like shit. The selection socks, look at that. It is jagged, it is it has a lot of fringes, and I expected it to look good, but you know. And the main reason for this kind of aggressive selection is probably because I didn't know the tools, I didn't know what to use, but nowadays I only use one tool and it's called the pen tool. So if you want to have a smooth, solid, great looking selection, I highly recommend using the pen tool no matter what. If you're going to just cut a solid object out of the background, like a cube, I don't know, a table, a car, or anything like that. If you want to cut a person out of the background, if you want to cut a tree, if you want to cut anything, always use the pen tool. That should be your first tool to use. So now let's switch back to this. If I zoom in onto the edges, you can see that the selection is not good. There are some fringes on the edges. If I zoom in closely, you're going to be able to see them. And the selection is not refined at all. On the hands, maybe, you can clearly see those white fringing halos. You might think to yourself that, okay, these edges are not going to be visible when we zoom out or maybe when we blur the edges. And no, nobody can even see these, but you're wrong, man. People can see details and actually that is the first thing that they pay attention to. So you might want to be accurate as much as possible on the details. Here is another manipulation I did a long time ago. And to be honest, I love this one. I'm so proud of myself for making this because the colors, the lighting, everything looks decent. It has depth and all that good stuff. But there's one thing missing and it's the selection. I did not pay enough selection. What? Yo, yeah. 
I did not pay enough selection to the attention. You, you get what I mean, okay? And if I zoom in onto this image, the leaves, the water, the selection's off. So we're done with this tip. Always make sure that your selection looks good. Always use the pen tool. And if you're not used to the pen tool, get used to it. Yeah. That's man, that's a must. That's just something you have to do. If you want to be a good artist, you have to do this. <laughs>